Happy year 10. Welcome back for part two of this thrilling poetry analysis of the poem Plenty. Um, we've gone through summary, we've gone through purpose, we've gone through tone, and then looked at a, a more in-depth um, summary uh, of each stanza. Now we want to, before we get any further into this poem, I want to make sure that uh, you realize one of the steps in analyzing a poem is checking on definitions. Uh, if there's a word in a poem that you don't understand, or even that you're just like a little bit unsure of, um, it's, I mean, you should, any anytime you find a word that you're not sure of, you should look it up. Um, but I would say this is especially important in poetry because poetry is like condensed language. Um, poets don't use as many words as, um, let's say, short story writers or novel writers um, or even magazine article writers. Okay? It's condensed. It's um, dense language use. And so you should make sure that you've got full appreciation for any word that's being used. Okay? Uh, so on the next page, I've got a list of a few I thought might be helpful that I thought you might not know, but if there are any other words besides the words that I've um, put on this vocabulary list that you're unsure of, I want you to pause the the video after you're done with uh, the vocabulary slide and jot down any other words that you'd like to look up later on, okay? Um, I, I could, I mean, I, I don't have time to go through the entire uh, glossary of the poem, but um, I want to hit a few that I thought might, um, there might be several people that don't understand, okay? Uh, so, <coughs> sorry, um, I wanted to start, make sure that the title word plenty, I, now probably that's a word that most of you understand, but it's worth looking at because it's the title word and because there's so many links to the title throughout the poem, um, just to make sure you appreciate or note or remember that when you use the word plenty, it means that you have a lot of something and that you have more than you need. Okay, if you have plenty, um, it means that you have some enough for yourself and, and to share with others. It means that you don't have to worry about your supply, okay? Um, second word that I thought might cause a little bit of grief is the word pocked, okay? Um, if we look here, it's one of the words that's used to describe the bathtub. She says, our old enamel tub, age stained and pocked upon its griffin claws, okay? So pocked is a descriptive word for, uh, if you've got like a, a surface that's supposed to be kind of smooth and it's got little, little divots, little holes or pits uh, that have been uh, left on the surface. It makes um, like, instead of a smooth surface, it looks kind of damaged. Okay, next word is griffin. And Griffin is a mythical creature that's half eagle, half lion. And um, I have images for some of these words on my next slide. So uh, if you're like, I have no idea what you're talking about, um, <laughs> I have a, a drawing of this type of mythical creature called a Griffin. And then we've got the word disgorged. Now, maybe you've heard um, somebody use the word like to gorge. On something and gorging has the idea of like stuffing a bunch of stuff into your mouth um, some kind of food that you're sort of binge eating or whatever if you gorge yourself you fill yourself with something to disgorge something is like the opposite so um, I've sort of made this a nice um, <laughs> definition to pour out from Okay, for something to be disgorged from something else, it pours out. And it pours out of the throat or the mouth of it, okay? Another word, it could, I mean, kind of disgusting, but like vomit, okay? Um, and 
this is, remember this word is used when she's talking about, where is it, here, that the hot water is disgorged from fat brass taps, okay? The water come, is, comes out of the mouth or throat of the taps. Co-conspirators, maybe this isn't a new word for you, but um, we want to understand that if someone is your co-conspirator, it's somebody who you um, make plans together to usually secretly do something wrong or maybe even evil, something illegal, okay? So a conspirator, someone who makes a secret plan to do something wrong, okay? Um, we want to look at, this is a personification use, so uh, I want to make sure you understood uh, the meaning of the word. Sybarite is probably the most unfamiliar word uh, from the poem, and uh, even in the um, Cambridge Anthology, I think this word is um, glossed for you. It means someone who's devoted to luxury or pleasure, and I guess it, it's Come, you can see that it's um, capitalized here. It, well, I guess I have all of them capitalized, but um, it, because it's based on an ancient Greek uh, city called Sybaris, where the city was known for its luxury, apparently. And so a Sybarite is someone who lived in this city and lived a luxurious life. And so now the word is used to just describe somebody who likes their creature comforts, uh, likes luxury, and maybe even lives for it, okay? And then lastly, this is not a word that appears in the poem, okay? You're like, grimace, I didn't hear that. No, but I think it's an important word um, due to all the time spent on the mom's face, okay? Now, a grimace is just, it's a word that you might want to use when you're analyzing this poem, when you're talking about the mom's facial expression. Maybe you come up with another word, um, like frown or something like that. But a grimace is, is a facial expression that indicates either disapproval or pain. Someone makes a grimacing face um, it usually means they have some kind of pain, whether it be physical or emotional or, um, you know, whatever kind of pain they might be in. Or um, the, it might be that they disapprove of something. And, um, and again, it could be another person, a decision, um, something that's going on around them. Okay, um, but it's, it's a negative facial expression for sure. Okay, um, my next slide. So if, if you haven't finished copying these down, feel free to pause the video and finish those up, but I'm going to keep going. Uh, and this is just to help if, you know, help make sure you understand some of these words I've been um, defining for you. Uh, first off, um, this is a griffin. Okay, <laughs> notice how the front half is an eagle and the back half is a lion. And when it talks about a griffin's claws, they're talking about these front feet here. And, and then I've also tried to include a photo of the type of tub she's talking about. Okay, one of these old kind of antique enamel tubs that had these um, kind of decorative, um, but you know, we consider be considered an antique style now. And if we were able to zoom in, you would a lot of times there's like a ball and the the claw. I don't know if, if you if you're catching this, but like the claw is like on top of it and it sits and each of the four feet of the um, tub looks like these eagle claws. Okay, that's what she's talking about when she says griffin claws. And this is a very beautiful looking tub. Okay, if I, I would, you know, if you had one in your home now and it was in nice condition, um, you, we would think that would it, it was, you know, a nice asset or, a, you know, nice decor. Um, but you don't get that uh, feeling about the one that's in her home. You get the idea from the poem. This is old enamel tub, age stained and pocked upon its griffin claws, right? That this is, it's old and kind of 
beat up <laughs> and it doesn't look like a pretty antique you know it looks it looks like an old beat up uh, out of date um, piece of well, I don't know if you want to call it appliance but anyway bathroom <laughs> appliance um, I don't know if you guys can see this super well on the screen if not go ahead and Google you know just pocked an image into a Google search. This is like a cement or concrete surface supposed to be smooth, but you can see all these little holes or divots in it. And that is an example of pocked, okay? So imagine that on the inside of the tub, okay? That it's chipped and banged up, okay? The enamel should be smooth. Instead, it's stained and got a bunch of pock marks uh, are dense in it, okay? You don't get the idea that this is n like a pretty, you know, pricey antique, okay? I've also included a f an image of fat brass taps, okay? Um, because they are a personified feature of the tub. Um, so if you can imagine these like, you know, at the end or in the center where the, the water comes out for the tub. Okay. And the last two pictures that I have have to do with this idea of um, the mom's face. Okay, if we look back at these two, um, well, mostly I guess it's the second stanza where it talks about that windmills stalled like mommy's smile, her lips stretched back and anchored down in anger at some fault. Okay. They're, she's trying to describe with really clear um, word choice here the expression that her mom's face often took. Okay, like this is how the mom always looked, and did my best to try to find some facial expressions where there's a sort of a grimacing look on the the women's faces. Okay, and it. The girl, the uh, sorry, the narrator in the poem talks about it as if the mom's looks angry, okay. Um, but you also pick up from the poem that she's stressed, okay. But what it does, she describes that her the mom's smile stalls, like instead of you know turned up mouth and a smile, the mom's lips are stretched back. Okay, so you put up your face a little bit, <laughs> stretch back and anchor down. Okay, this idea of stretch tight and downturned as well. And so we get this uh, vivid image of this look of stress and strain that is always on the mom's face. And then she, she comes back to it too at the end of the fourth stands where she says her mouth a lid clamped hard on this so you have this like idea that the mom's mouth is set hard okay she, we have a real sense of her stress in this in this poem um that the children read as mean angry okay cranky and looking back uh the speaker now understands that it was likely stress and responsibility and pressure um, that the mom was facing. Okay, um, <clears throat> I think that's all I've got for the images, so we're ready to move along. Um, the next three items that I have have to do with title and speaker and structure. Okay, um, so I want to point out and this is going to be a real obvious thing, but poem subtitles, okay? <laughs> and it's important for you to notice the title, not to skip over the title and just start reading. Um, poets entitle their, their poetry on purpose. They carefully choose. Now, yes, sometimes you come across a poem that's simply just named by its first line. And I often think that um, that's probably an untitled poem, and it's just become known by its first, um, first line. Others, like 
um, people who crank out the sonnets, they just number them, sonnet one, sonnet two, sonnet three, okay, <laughs> and uh, they don't entitle them, so not every poem has a title, but when they are entitled by a poet, pay attention, okay, especially in this case, I think the, um, the title is really important, okay, um, it's your first connection with the poem and its ideas. Uh, you, the effects of the poetry starts with the poem. Uh, the poem, the, the title is the start uh, of the poem and sometimes it'll draw your attention or set expectations uh, when, you, when you find out that you're studying a poem and it's called Plenty you start imagining, okay, somebody with a lot of something, somebody who has enough. And then you quickly are given this picture of a family who doesn't have plenty, who doesn't have enough. And so she's looking at this subject of plenty. Um, she uses the word here at the beginning of the second stanza, such plenty, meaning a, a full bathtub. Well, it didn't happen for them, okay? It be in their expanse of drought, okay? The plenty is uh, contrasted with uh, drought and too little, not having enough, okay? So um, back to the effects of the poem start with the title, okay? Because they draw our focus, they set up our expectations, um, they make, they uh, bring images to mind. They bring feelings to mind. Um, we, we're already engaging with a poem as soon as we read its title. Um, and you want to think about perhaps what the poet is trying to draw attention to or get you thinking um, before you even jump into their poem. Um, so there's plenty, <laughs> plenty of connections uh, throughout the poem uh, with the title. Okay, so I would like you to pause the video right now and have a look back at the poem and look for connections with the title. Maybe choose a highlighter um, and highlight the, the, the poem's title with a certain color. And then go, th go through slowly and look for any connections that have to do with having plenty or like the lack of having plenty, okay? Now, don't take up all, all your space. We're gonna work with this poem a lot. Um, you're gonna, I'm gonna ask you to mark up a lot of things. Um, so make sure that you're, you know, that you maybe underline or highlight and save, save room to do more marking in the future. But I think it's a um, good exercise for you to look at the connections and the developed theme that happens throughout. Okay, go ahead and pause the video and mark connections to the title. Okay, things that you might have marked that connect with this idea of plenty or the lack thereof uh, would be right away here in the first stanza, these, the build up, okay? She really builds up to this, but this idea of never full, okay? Their, their bathtub was never full. Then of course you likely got this word plenty marked. Such plenty was too dear in our expanse of drought, okay? Expanse of drought, um, drought uh, as you should know, or maybe you looked it up, Drought means the lack of water or rain in a place. So you have like very dry uh, land and uh, lots of times crops suffer and um, a, a place might be economically depressed during a drought, okay? Um, maybe you also highlighted the word leaked or stalled um, because we have a lack of water and we have a lack of wind, okay? And windmills are usually powering something, um, creating electricity or power for something. And so if you've, if you've got a windmill and no wind, again, you're lacking, okay? And then as you move on through 
the uh, poem, then you've got this idea of that she's counting things, um, and perhaps you highlighted this word, even the toilet paper counted. Okay? It's again this idea that they don't have enough. Maybe you highlighted too long, weeks too long, uh, the idea that um, they don't have enough money to make it through the month. Okay. Um, another connection would be this idea of another precious inch because what we're talking about is at the beginning not having a full bathtub, not having enough water to take um, you know kind of a nice bath <laughs> where there's plenty of water um, and so a precious inch would connect with that idea we're just talking you know, a little bit <laughs> of water <laughs> um, but uh, for them that inch is like taking more than they can afford really and then you've got several connections to it here in the seventh stanza where she talks about the water's plentiful excess okay um maybe you made more connections okay i mean really this poem is about you know when she has plenty and when she doesn't <laughs> okay so really you can like highlight the whole thing like there i did it um but you want to look for um specific connections and i would say the last one ooh, that you might have um highlighted is this lean dry times okay the times looking back when times were lean things the sort of the money um where the resources were dried up okay? and because she uses this um ongoing image of the bathtub um, the dryness um, really works well. The drought and the dry times uh, is in contrast to this full bubbly bathtub that she can enjoy when she's an adult. Okay, um, moving from title to speaker and voice. A um, couple notes here. The speaker in this poem is um, the telling her perspective in first person, of course, um, about when she was a child looking at her mother. Okay, so the narrator's voice and giving her perspective as a child looking at the mom. That's the perspective we get stanzas one through six. And then we have the, the switch uh, from starting at the beginning of stanza seven, where um, the narrator's voice then switches to adult perspective looking back at her mom and her childhood. We see that this poem is told from a very personal point of view and that it's based heavily on memory or a, ref a reflection on the past. And the uh, last thing I want to do in this video, last topic, is to look at structure and form. Uh, you know, you want to identify things about a poem when you say, first of all, that you can name them with the, the correct technical, technical words, but then uh, you also want to be able to talk about in your analytical essays if the structure and form um, link to any meaning that's being created. Do they um, cooperate with something else that the poet is saying. So to like add to the meaning or uh, enrich the meaning of the poem. So in this poem we see that um, Dixon has arranged the lines of her poem into eight quatrains, okay? And because you're studying your um, vocabulary or your sorry, your terms for poetry, you know that a quatrain is a four-line stanza. And you can see, you can count them eight up, okay? Every single one is four lines long, okay? There's no um, variation in the stanza length, right? So eight quatrains. However, those 
quatrains are written in free verse, meaning there's no regular rhyme or rhythm to this poem. Okay? She doesn't have a rhyme scheme that she's following, and you can tell by looking at the line length that they're irregular, meaning, um, like if I put it like a ruler here, they don't all kind of line up. All right, they've got long ones, short ones, okay? She doesn't have a set um, meter or even, you know, number of syllables um, that she's keeping herself to. Never mind, you know, a regular rhythm, okay? That's not to say that you won't find um, aspects of rhythm uh, in the poem or things that kind of stand out because of some sound effect that she uses. Um, but she doesn't, it doesn't have regular rhythm. So even though the stanza length is set or regular, the, um, the rhyme and rhythm is not set or regular. And so we classify it as free verse. Oops, wrong, wrong <laughs> slide. Uh, so it, we, we classify this as free verse. Another structure point, and I can't believe I didn't include this word in the terms that I gave you. I was thinking about this today when I put these slides together. I thought, what in the world did I not put volta in your terms for? So this is another term that you need to learn. Um, it's, uh, and it means a shift or turning point. And this is something that you want to look for in poetry. It happens a lot where something turns. There's some kind of turn that happens or a shift that happens in the voice or perspective or something. Okay. Um, in fact, I think volta is simply the Italian word for turn. Okay. So um, you want to look for this in, because you're going to see it in plenty of poems. And, and then you want to ask yourself, of course, what's the uh, poet doing with that shift? What, what are they shifting away from to or shifting my attention to or does it create contrast? Does it uh, compare something? Um, you know there could be a number of things that it does. Here we see the turn at the beginning of stanza seven from past tense to present tense. Okay so our her simply her verb tenses switch. Um, it's signaled to us with the word now, okay, that shift, it's it's like the the pivot point, now. And then you can see these um, present tense verbs, am, lap, okay? And even though these are apostrophe s's, these are is, the shower is a hot cascade, the water is plentiful, okay? All of the verbs she uses here are in um, present tense. Um, back here in the first six stanzas, we everything's written in past tense, and it uh, shows that she's, you know, it's something that happened in the past, that she's looking back as a memory, um, and talking about her childhood. Okay, and um, it also is a shift from uh, the child perspective to the adult perspective, like I've already mentioned, and it allows one thing that allows to happen is this comparison to be made, which is the ease of her adult life compared to the difficulty of the past. Okay, that's one of the uh, effects of this shift or turn in the structure. Okay, you want to notice when this happens in a poem um, and mark it. So on your copy of the poem, um, make sure that you Right, volta or shift. I often annotate it with like a double kind of forward slash, and I often will write shift or volta to be, um, you know, uh, technically correct with your um, terminology. Um, last slide I want to go over in this uh, video that's getting rather long is um, that the connection between form and meaning. Okay, you, I may be getting just a little bit ahead of myself here, but I, if you're going to make comments in your essays about structure or form, you don't want to just say, hey, look, it's a free verse. Hey, look, uh, the stanzas are four lines long each. Pretty good, right? Okay, that's, 
not enough, okay? That's um, what we call feature spotting, okay? It's good for you to be able to spot features, but unless you're going to talk about how it adds to the meaning or what effect it creates, you really shouldn't mention it, okay? But one, um, I, one of the features of higher, um, higher level essays is this, are the students who's, who in their essays can make comments, not just on language choices, but also on uh, structure and form and how they connect or um, how they uh, enrich meaning, okay? It's not worth talking about if you can't connect it to meaning, okay? And you don't want to force something either. You don't want to like, oh, I'm pretty sure it means that, you know, and just make something up that isn't at all related to the poem's meaning. So the first thing you need to think about is what you think the poem means and, and what the purpose is and, and what the poem seems to be uh, expressing. Uh, and then think if there are connections between the form, uh, the way that the poet has decided to structure it. I think, uh, in my humble opinion, this um, poem does have some connections between form and meaning that could um, be discussed in a um, in an essay. So one thing is that we've got this mixture of set stanza length, okay, the four, every, every stanza is four lines, okay, and, but it's mixed with this free verse, um, we see in jammed lines um, that doesn't, we don't just see in a that go from line to line, but actually over the stanza breaks, okay. I, I suggest that possibly um, this could be to mimic the control the mom tries to impose on the chaos of her life and her children um, and the stress of trying to get them to cooperate with her attempts to keep the family afloat. And by afloat, um, I'm not just being punny, I'm um, meaning like it's an expression like you keep yourself financially afloat, you know, keep things moving along. Um, she's, she seems to be carrying the weight of keeping the family fed, enough toilet paper in the bathroom, and that kind of thing. Um, and we see that the poet has put this um, structure of four lines, four lines, four lines, but it's not like um, at the end of each stanza you know, she's sort of completed and finished her thought. Um, instead, we see um, several examples where the thought runs from one stanza to the next. And so even though there's this, like, you know, structure or this <laughs> attempt at controlling uh, the poetry, it, it's running wild and free <laughs> in between. And possibly it could be you know, connect to this idea that the life is chaotic, that her kids are chaotic, and and she talks about that the mom trying to keep control and everything was something that was keeping them all from chaos. And I think what she means is not just like naughty kids running around, but like um, financial chaos, emotional chaos, um, that mom's trying to make it work so that their family um, doesn't... Um, you know, kind of spin out of control. Um, but you see that the children aren't cooperating with her, okay? She's trying to make things last. She's trying to say, okay, you know, um, you know, you can only have one biscuit. You can only have so much of this. Ah, uh, you spilled the milk. <laughs> you know, that's like a whole cup's worth. Um, even to the extent of counting toilet paper, okay? Um, uh, there are people in the world who are so, you know, tight on their resources that they have to limit family members to how many squares of toilet paper that they can use when they go, okay? That might be, to you be a very foreign concept, but people live like that, okay? Um, and that's how they lived. But the, the children aren't cooperating with it, okay? So you get this idea of, you know, this... Um, with the stanza length, 
like this attempt at control, but within this, you know, from stanza to stanza, um, the, the, the thoughts are not contained within the stanza length. And um, I think that it, um, it mimics the moms. But you see, once we get to the um, stanza seven and eight, uh, both of those, you know, there's only two of them, but they, they kind of end their thoughts um, with full stops and kind of complete, uh, where here we get more of a sense of, you know, out of control or, um, you know, running crazy or this like running riot. Okay, now you might think, ah, Mrs. Sprinkle, what, what are you trying to do? <laughs> um, but that's an example of uh, finding meaning uh, that that links with the meaning of the poem. You don't, like I said, you don't want to just kind of make something up and you know give it meaning that the poet maybe didn't intend. Did she intend for that? Uh, I'm not sure. It's an interpretation. Okay, it's something that you can suggest uh, could uh, add to the effects of the um, the effects of and, and add to meaning of the poem. Okay, all right, we're gonna pause here and end this video, um, and I'll see you in part three.